Wanderlust by Lale Kadidi. Vui are Ina, Yulia, Victoria, Jana, Snajana, Tamara, Alesha, Naderja, Olena. We come from St. Petersburg, Moskva, Kursk, Barnul, Haikov, Odessa, Yakaterinburg, Stavropol, or Novosibirsk. Our hobbies are running, skating, biking and or sailing, aerobics, dance and or kickboxing, stretching and or chess. We were born under the signs of Aquarius, Pisces, Virgo, Capricorn, Gemini, Cancer, Sagittarius, Scorpio, Taurus, Libra, Aries or Leo. Some of us are 1.6 meters tall, some of us are 1.8 meters tall. We believe in God, or we are orthodox, or we are spiritual, or it is not important. Our English is preliminary, need a translator, or conversational, or excellent, or fluent. We smoke occasionally, we never smoke. We drink occasionally, we never drink. We have been married once, we have never been married. We are divorced. We have no children. We have one child. Here we are in photos. Have a look. We are at the beach. We are in a hay-filled barn. We are in front of a fireplace, wearing the sort of fur cap you might recognize from Dr. Zhvago. <laughs> See our lovely skin, shimmering eyes of blue or black or brown. Our long hair of any imaginable shade. Gaze at our narrow shoulders and slender waists, our full mouths and delicate necks. Click and click and click, until we are a single, many-headed woman, a blur of smiles and eyes that call to you and announce, we are a sensitive, funny, outgoing, warm, sweet, intelligent, sexy, disciplined, professional, resolute, stubborn woman from Russia, looking for a tall, athletic, confident, successful, witty, kind, financially stable, generous man <laughs> from anywhere else. <laughs> and yes, we swear we are the women we claim to be, just as we were all once girls. At six, seven, eight years old, we watched television all day to see a wall in Berlin, a cold, grey city, not unlike our own cold grey city, tumble and tumble and tumble again. When we asked our mothers what was happening, they shook their heads and tried to explain it to us in terms we could understand. Tisk, just an old bear, like any old bear in the forest, darling, shot a hundred times over a hundred years, and just now beginning to feel the pain of the bullets. But what will happen to the poor bear, Mama? Who will take care of her? We asked. We will see, our mothers answered. We will see. So we waited and watched our mothers and fathers and the mothers and fathers of our friends and our teachers and the bus driver and the checkout clerk. If the adults around us paced, smoked cigarette after cigarette and asked each other, where will we get our food? Who will pay our pensions? What jobs will there be if there is no state? Then we were anxious too, nervously chewing gum, explaining the coming hard times to our stuffed animals and imaginary friends. You must behave very well, so we won't be thrown out into the streets and made to eat from the dumpsters and to wash ourselves in the subway bathrooms where the rats drink. <coughs> if the adults around us were indifferent and shouted at each other, one government, another government. This is Russia, always Russia. <laughs> then we walked around with a brave attitude and entertained our friends by proclaiming, who cares? Nothing is going to change. Where is for babies? <laughs> by 14, 15, 16, we were old enough to understand that little uncertainties tuck themselves into bigger uncertainties, like our famous nesting dolls. In those early years, we watched as the first reformist president became more and more of a buffoon in the eyes of our parents and grandparents, teachers and neighbors. 
we learned that we were a people without a guide in a dark time. What we'd once understood as a strong, unassailable state was now a long, nervous joke as leaders fell and the Congress collapsed and the banks shut our parents' accounts and community store shelves emptied as the hypermarts and malls opened, filled with a quantity and variety of food and clothes and toys such as we had never imagined. Skyscrapers rose in the cities and the first generation of oligarchs clogged the Moskva streets with their imported cars. We learned that money was a goal unto itself. And just as we turned 14, 15, 16, and started to look about for answers to questions we dared not ask, what makes a woman a woman, a man a man? We saw our mothers defiant or supplicant, but always dignified, and our fathers Men who had been giants in our girlhoods, massive from labor, open-throated with song and laughter, now given to silence and drinking, drinking and anger, anger and sorrow. At the same time, the magazines and televisions and billboards showed us another kind of a man and woman and family, smiling, fit, often at the beach, often in America. At 15, 16, 17, we dangled a shoe over the precipice of girlhood. Our hearts began to beat with heat and want and a lust for love. Our girlhood bodies slipped from us like old sweaters, and what had grown beneath was often stunning and confusing in equal measure. Our lips and lashes breasts and legs filled and extended, and we woke each morning and found ourselves changed. Some of our mothers watched over it all with a knowing eye and gave advice. If a man invites you for a lift in his car, refuse. If they try to talk to you when you walk down the street, don't listen to them. Keep your eyes on the sidewalk. It was only a matter of time before others noticed the changes as well. Our brothers and fathers made remarks. Our sisters ran their hands over our breasts and giggled or gasped. But no one noticed more than the men from our apartment block. Our father's friends from the office or the factory or the field. Or our brother's forever sweating classmates who now found reasons to stop and talk to us, to pause for an extra second and ask, are those Levi's you're wearing? <laughs> they look good. <laughs> Sometimes we were followed by leering men who lived on the streets or in the train stations and their gaze stuck to us like greasy fingerprints. Other kinds of men looked at us too, men we had never seen before. Russia's new type of men in silk suits and crisp English raincoats, their hair gelled so that it didn't move. Sometimes they were bald and driven around by chauffeurs who knew to slow down as they passed a group of us walking home from school. Sometimes they were young and handsome and surrounded by two or three women. We noticed their curious, hungry stares and returned them with curious, hungry stares of our own. By 20, 21, 22, we had entered a new century a new millennium, and we were no longer scared little girls and cared not at all about what happened to that bear in the woods. Political leaders, popular songs, and state-sponsored advertisements told us that it was up to the young to rebuild Russia. The future was ours. A few of us believed this and tried out for jobs that required us to wear the ugly uniforms of store clerks and fast food servers, and the work made us grumble and slouch. Some of us chose to forego work and clung to boyfriends who turned into husbands and then into fathers like our own, taciturn and drunk, belligerent and drunk, or depressed and drunk or some odd combination of them all. 
depending on the day of the week and the weather and the sports results. Nevertheless, by 2021, 20, 22, some of us were married. Here were marriages of love, marriages of duty, marriages of boredom or lack of imagination. One of us married a short, odious neighbor she had never liked, simply because he stood a good chance of inheriting his grandmother's elegant pre-revolution cottage on the Volga River. <laughs> it's simple, she exclaimed. We will have children, I might have affairs, and nine months of the year we will be miserable and cold. But for the three months of summer, I will live in paradise, jump straight off the porch and into the water and eat fresh berries every day. You are crazy if you think that life can be more than that. <laughs> For those of us crazy enough to think that life could be more, if only just a little bit, there was university. We went to earn degrees that would get us jobs that paid well. We longed to put our hands in our pocketbooks and pull out a plane ticket to Greece, a bra made of French lace, a pair of designer shoes like the ones we saw in the magazine. Some of us were too impatient for classes, tests, and degrees, and we walked around at 20, 21, 22, asking ourselves, why can't I go live in the world, be a part of something more than this confused, old-fashioned place? We researched exit visas, one-way tickets to New York, English lessons. I can stay with some good Piotr in Queens, when I was six, seven, eight, he always told me I was his favorite. In a manner of prayers being answered, <laughs> the machines that would grant us our exodus appeared. We found them in our brother's bedrooms, at university libraries, in the offices where we worked, and most readily in the hundreds of new internet cafes where teenage boys left behind sticky keyboards. Just like that, we could type in the name of a town, a city, a country. And just like that, there was a map, information in Russian, photographs of the main streets. The proprietors of the cafes took great care in explaining to us the mechanics of the internet, which they told us with confidence was going to change everything. This computer you sit in front of, is connected to almost every other computer in the world. With a click of a mouse, you can contact your Uncle Piotr in America. Amazing, really. We agreed. Amazing. And the moment they left us alone, we took out the pieces of paper hidden in our purses and pockets and typed in the addresses given to us by friends. Listen. Go to this website. Leena's sister tried it, and now she lives in Switzerland. She is married to a banker. They have a maid. <laughs> we type slowly and carefully. Russianbride.com Ukrainiandelight.com Yourrussianlove.com and just like that, there we were, or at least versions of ourselves. <laughs> Women of 18, 22, 31, who looked like us and wanted what we wanted. We sat before this machine, one part oracle, one part mirror, enchanted by the possibilities and all wishing the exact same wish. The questionnaires were easy. 45 kilos, blue, brown, black, slender, well-shaped, rock, classical, thrillers, romances, mysteries, responsible, independent, calm, open-minded, kind. Some of us didn't believe it would lead to anything. Some of us spent hours with the <coughs> Russian English dictionaries poorly translating our deepest desires and personal details. I have golden hair, 
and diamond blue shade eyes. <laughs> One day I would like to manage a hospital for sick children who are tired. <laughs> Lucky for us, the questions were few, and we devoted most of our energy to our photographs. Casual shots, the sites requested, alone if possible. Fine clothing helps present a flattering picture. No nudity. We all had old photographs tacked to the walls of our bedrooms. Pictures of our second, third, or fourth birthdays. Our grandmothers holding a cake. Our mothers smiling beside us. Our thin chests in homemade sweaters that were too big. And then, a few photos later, too small. Those of us who could afford it had professional photos taken. Others saved money for the photographer's fees or begged our weak-willed fathers for it. If we could not bear to explain ourselves, we stole the money from our mother's purses. With the help of the cafe owners, our images floated into the computer. And suddenly, there we were. Russian doll 5399, bride-to-be 21482, Miss Lady 953. The cafe owners peered over our shoulders and smoked. You look nice. Yes, we agreed, seeing our face, body, birth date, height, eye color, favorite color, wishes, and dreams, all as if for the first time. The cafe owners took our rubles and stared at us with confused expressions. I don't understand it. Why can't you be happy here with a Russian man? Your father and grandfathers were Russian men. Why not marry your own? Stay close to your family. Make children for this new country. Is it so bad here? Some of our mothers found out when we told them, and some of them found out when our brothers or sisters dragged them to the computer cafes to show them our webpage. She says she is 1.8 meters tall, Mama. See, that is a lie. <laughs> and when we came home for dinner, our mothers greeted us with slaps and insults, or tears of shock, or enormous embraces and confessions. If I were your age, I would do the same thing. Yes, why not? I may still do it. <laughs> I am only 43, 44, 45. Your father won't even notice I am gone. <laughs> Many of us didn't tell our mothers or anyone. And if a man we had been emailing paid us a visit or sent us an airline ticket and secured us a visa, then our mothers wasted no time in calling us sluts and whores as they cried in our doorways while we passed. We stayed strong. We shouted back at them, I am going because I am in love, and that is better than this. <sighs> what did we know of love? We knew love as we'd first discovered it, at five, six, seven. The love we'd learned from storybooks. The love the mermaid had for the prince, so strong it lured her out of the sea to her deaths on the land. There was the love we learned in school, the love for our mother country, the adoration we pledged to farmers, cosmonauts, and soldiers we had never met. There were our first loves, the boy in history class who rarely spoke, or the neighbor's son down the hall who played heavy metal music and never looked us in the eye. Some of us let these loves drive us crazy as girls do when they are 11, 12, 13. Mm. After that, love changed turned into a strong chemistry, irrational and hasty, that left us dry in the throat and hot between the legs. We sat closer to the boys on the bus, let them hold our hands, wished for more but did not know how to name it, and so could not properly <coughs> ask, could you please love me? What did we know of love? Our parents kept framed photographs of their wedding days in their bedrooms, and we stared at their rigid bodies and expectant faces and opulent hairdos and asked, Is this love? The man and woman in the photo said nothing. 
while down the hall our fathers farted loudly and our mother slowly put the dishes away. A few of us knew love professed by boys who followed us like hapless dogs. I will do anything you like. We laughed at them. What could they offer us? These were boys we had known our whole lives. Boys we've seen naked at the lake, wrestled with and touched and held before we'd even noticed they were boys. We wanted nothing to do with them. Then there were the few of us who, at 14, 15, 16, had gone all the way, had felt our first or second or third raptures, had said the words and heard the words, and a new romance as it has been known since the beginning of time. For them, the questionnaires were a small torture. We posted photos of ourselves wearing conservative clothes and dim smiles, and made no mention of looking for Mr. Right or dreaming of love. We had found it and lost it, and at that age, we thought it was something that happened only once in life. We spent hours at the computer cafes, waiting for responses to come, to see if any responses had come in. Some of us went in pairs and trios and held hands as if the screen were about to reveal the names and faces of our future husbands. Some of us sat alone in front of the computer and swore we would not tell, we would tell no one what we were about to find out. And every last one of us was disappointed. The men were old, some of them older than our fathers. They were bald or had unforgivable hair. <laughs> Their bodies were fat and misshapen or thin and without form. If they were British, they had bad teeth. <laughs> and if they were American, they wore the white grin of the wolf in the fairy tale of Little Red Cat. <coughs> Those were the ones who sent pictures of their faces. Most of the messages came to us with a single photograph of just one section of a man, usually from the belly button to the knees, sometimes standing, sometimes sitting always naked. We turned away from the computer. Where is his face? <laughs> we muttered in disbelief. Later in our lives, it would become a joke. Where is his face? Ha ha. <laughs> Some of us flipped desperately through our Russian English dictionaries, looking up words and phrases. Plaything, erotic. A Russian doll for all my needs. And some of us, even more desperate, hired translators, discreet girls we knew and trusted who excel at languages. It says here he is divorced. He has four children. He is looking for stimulation only, no commitment. He thinks you are very beautiful, like Julie Christie in Dr. Zhvago. <laughs> he would like to feel your skin by a warm fire. <laughs> he told his translators to write back, I am a good Russian girl, and you are a piece of shit not worth stepping on with my dirtiest shoe. <laughs> and some of us wrote back ourselves, Yes, I can be your Russian kitten, but first we must meet. You may send a ticket for me at this address. And if we were too upset by the impoliteness of the invitations, we didn't bother with a response and simply took the tissues offered by the cafe owners who patted our shoulders affectionately as we cried. What is the point? Who was I to think that life could be better elsewhere? I am a fool. The cafe owners spoke to us in gentle tones. Oh, there now. What is so bad about your life here? We have no war. The worst of the poverty is gone, we hope. <laughs> and just look at you. You are young and beautiful. And if you want work, there is much work for the young. If you want love, there is love here. My son, <laughs> myself. <laughs> and with that, 
Even the saddest of us left the cafe is more determined than ever to write our own futures. Futures better than those that seemed only a repeat of generations long past. After a while, our hungry ears started to hear success stories. They were few and far between, but we listened greedily to tales of the good fortune that had reached out from the computer screen and swept up a friend of a friend of a friend. One girl met a man from Australia. He flew all the way from Tunovusabirs to meet me. Can you believe it? He is tall and tan and has a job in marketing. He bought me a ticket to visit him after just two days here. <laughs> he has tattoos covering both his arms. And at first it bothered me, but now it is okay. You should see them. They are very different than the tattoos on prisoners here. <laughs> they don't have anything to do with the mafia or murder. They are pretty even, like art. Other women, other stories. I met his family, and none of them would talk to me. They called me rude words under their breath. I could tell by the way they said them. After a while, it was hard to pretend I didn't hear. What could I do? I was stuck. I couldn't even find where I was on the map. And still other stories. Yes, we married. I am a citizen now, and everything is wonderful. I have my own car, my own bathroom. He's gone most of the week, and when we see each other, he does not like to talk to me or touch me. I am learning that this is just his way. I will get used to it. We used the good parts of the stories to keep our hopes up. Many of us began to answer responses from men who did not on first glance appeal to us. We found ourselves having romantic long-distance conversations with kind old grandfathers and men who resembled the janitors from our elementary schools. We spent more time at the computer cafes and less time at home. And our parents and siblings grew accustomed to our absence and soon they began to treat us as if we were not there at all. Of the men we had kept communications with, there was one who seemed smart enough, funny enough, and not so perverted that we would be afraid. He was not our fantasy, but he looked like a man who would support us should we arrive in his life tomorrow. We started writing him warm notes. We dug around inside ourselves for some glimmer of affection with which to express our intentions. Yes, I would very much like for you to visit. Yes, I am available to see you. Yes, I can leave Russia right now. I am very excited. As we typed, we pushed back the dark stories of the men who beat up girls on their arrival, tied them to beds, refused them phone calls, food, daylight. We told ourselves, I am different. I am stronger. I know how to get out of a bad situation. I can always run away if I have to. And this is what we were thinking as we smiled prettily and wheeled our bags out of customs and searched for the face that we hoped was searching for ours. For some of us, it is our first time. We tell the men this, or we don't. Regardless, they take us in whatever way they know how. They take us nervously. They take us quickly. They take us with anger, curiosity, exhilaration or humility and we let them and we wait for them to finish and we wonder was that it some of us beg for them to stop saying it hurts and if they are kind they will ask where does it hurt but we can't pinpoint it because the pain is not just in our bodies but somewhere deeper where we cannot reconcile the strange sheets the strange sky outside the window, the strange man doing strange things to us, and we are overcome with sadness. For others still, the first time is a welcome surprise, and we lock easily into an ancient rhythm of pleasure that may one day belong to us both. 
some of us don't last a week. We are scared or harassed or bored or had a plan to leave the man from the very start. We wait until he is out of the house and take whatever won't mark us obviously as a criminal and hits the streets of Boise or Dallas, Tampa or Los Angeles and we are full of exhilaration and terror. We find work where we can and live day to day and try not to think about the past. The jobs we get are at the bottom, cleaning offices, washing laundry, taking care of children, taking our clothes off on stage for the dead eyes of truck drivers and men in the military. Many of us came from houses where our mothers often walked around naked, and the exchange of currency for nudity strikes us first as a fortuitous joke, and then as a tiresome occupation. In the end, we make enough to live on, and our English improves from all the between-dance conversation. Yes, I am from Russia. Yes, I want to be a lawyer, a dress designer, a business owner. The men are impressed by our optimism and determination. You know, you are just like the pioneers who came here all those years ago. So brave, they tell us. America needs more women like you. If we stay with the man for a few years, the children come. We have one and then another, and if things are going well, maybe a third. We speak to them at the playground in happy sing-song Russian, while the American mothers and Filipino or Jamaican nannies stare. We can't help ourselves. Russia is the only language in which we can properly tell our children we love them. And love them we do. So much it makes us homesick. Some of us combat the constant longing for our mothers, our sisters, our holidays, our foods, by forcing ourselves to become Americans alongside our American children. We sing the ugly patriotic songs, learn the Pledge of Allegiance and the correct spelling of Wednesday and February for their tests. When it comes to math, we teach them the Russian way. And though they protest, their scores are always the highest in the class. There are some among us who come to resent our children, who chide them when they reply to us in English instead of Russian, when they look too much like their fathers. We try not to blame them for how marooned we are in America, but we are quick to discipline and even quicker to anger. Frustrated by our own cruelty, we lock ourselves in the bathrooms as clean as any Russian kitchen and let the mirrors tell us what we refuse to tell ourselves. We hate this life. The children we detest chain us to the men we do not love or even care for. Go ahead then, our reflections tell us. Leave. It is okay. Leave it all. The family, the home, the nest. You have done it before. You can do it again. And some of us do as we are told. Either way, the children age. They take on American personalities and American nicknames given to them by their fathers and schoolmates and aunts. If we stay long enough, they eventually leave us, returning home dutifully on holidays or vacations. And after some years, they ask questions. What was Russia like? What was my grandfather like? Some of us claim we don't remember though not one of us has forgotten. At 54, 55, 56, we realize that the world is made up of two kinds of people. Those who, like our husbands and mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, stay where they are. And those who leave. We left seeking food, heat, mates, something our instincts told us to do. Did we want beautiful objects nestled in a beautiful life? Yes. Did we, per, were we perhaps inspired by our own beauty to crave a life different from the one in which we were born? Yes. 
were we wrong to want that? At 54, 55, 56, we are locked to this foreign soil, crying into strange rivers and swimming in enormous seas and dreaming in a language we did not speak as girls. If you had asked us at five, six, seven, what is your life going to be like? Not one of us would have said, I will drive a Honda. I will be a pharmacist. I will go by an American version of my name. No. All of us would have responded as Russian girls of that time did. I will live in a cottage in the woods. I will make friends with the bears. I will go to space with the cosmonauts. I will be happy and strong. Thank <laughs> you.